It's a depressingly masculine world we live in, Dolores. An accident, Dolores, can be an unhappy woman's best friend. Stephen King's novels Dolores Claiborne and Gerald's Game, published in the same year, share a profound connection despite their distinct narratives. Originally envisioned as a single work, these novels explore parallel themes of female resilience in the face of oppressive male figures and societal indifference. A central point of convergence is the total solar eclipse that serves as a turning point in both stories. During this symbolically charged moment, Dolores and Jesse, the respective protagonists, experience haunting glimpses of each other. This hints at a cultural connection forged between the women as they bond over shared trauma at the hands of the men in their lives. Both stories unflinchingly address themes of abuse within intimate relationships, confronting viewers with the devastating realities of domestic tyranny and sexual violence. However, the paths of the protagonists diverge in terms of their responses. Dolores takes drastic action, embodying a dark form of female power. You better hope I don't get out of here. <laughs> In contrast, Jessie's triumph lies in her internal strength and psychological survival, reflecting a different facet of feminine resilience. You had everything you need to survive from the beginning. King deftly weaves these intricate connections, subtly linking Dolores Claiborne and Gerald's game to give a more complete picture of feminist resistance. This literary bond underscores the universality of women's struggles while highlighting the diverse paths individuals take in confronting trauma and reclaiming their power. You're so much smaller than I remember. I want to go away for a week to see my sister in Connecticut. Stephen King isn't just a horror writer, he's an architect of unease. His mastery lies in weaving suspense and psychological terror into seemingly ordinary lives and familiar settings. Let me take a wild guess, I bet that Vera Donovan's got a whole freezer full of soil. King's ability to tap into our primal fears and exploit the vulnerabilities of everyday existence elevates him to the status of a master storyteller. But it's important to recognize that unease manifests differently for everyone. A nerdy kid's insecurities about his own masculinity might be apparent in his unhealthy relationship with his car. A sheltered girl will be terrified by the changes in her body and the confusion of sexual politics she's being exposed to for the first time. So it's no surprise that the dual female protagonists of his 1992 novels share a horror straight out of King's Raw second wave feminism. As always, your enjoyment of the films may be eclipsed by spoilers, so be warned. And just what is your favorite connection in the Stephen King verse? Let me know in the comments. Dolores Claiborne, portrayed by a jittery and angry Kathy Bates, is accused of killing her wealthy and demanding employer, Vera Donovan. Initially painted as a cold-blooded killer, Dolores' story unfolds through a series of flashbacks, interspersed with her present-day interrogation. We learn of her abusive marriage to the alcoholic Joe St. George, played by the always great character actor David Strathairn, and the harrowing decisions she had to make for both her own and her daughter Selena's survival. As a big city reporter, Selena, played by Jennifer Jason Lee, who was becoming typecast at this point, returns to her island hometown to support her mother. God, look at you. Her initial skepticism gives way to a re-examination of her own childhood memories. Flashbacks reveal the extent of her father's cruelty, culminating in a fateful eclipse where decades-old secrets, buried deep in the well, are finally unearthed. Director Taylor Hackford masterfully uses visual techniques and Danny Elfman's evocative score to create an atmosphere of tension and psychological unease. The stark coastal landscapes of Maine mirror Dolores' internal turmoil, while the fractured narrative structure keeps the audience in a state of suspense. Dolores' direct address to the camera, breaking the fourth wall, creates a chilling intimacy, drawing the viewer into her desperate struggle. If he's out to torture somebody, I'd be more than happy to get back in the hot seat. The mother-daughter dynamic is complex and fraught. Dolores' fierce protectiveness led her to shield Selena from the harsh reality of their lives. This act, however well-intentioned, casts a long shadow of misunderstanding with Selena taking her father's side and seeing her mother as a weak and conniving woman who would rather have killed her husband than leave him. Can you not remember how I is remember that possible? you hitting him! That I remember! I remember the blood coming down his face! I remember the drinking! Only through confronting the past can Selena finally see her mother with clearer eyes, understanding the depth of her sacrifices. God, it's your father, ain't it? He's been at you, hasn't he? What are you talking about? <laughs> What's he done to you? Importantly, Dolores Claiborne doesn't shy away from portraying the lasting effects of trauma. Both mother and daughter bear the scars of the past, their experiences shaping how they navigate the world. While Dolores resorts to a hardened exterior, Selena struggles with substance abuse and fractured relationships. Maybe you ought to slow down. 
The film holds a mirror to societal attitudes towards domestic abuse, particularly in the period in which it's set. Dolores' story highlights how women were often trapped in abusive relationships with little societal or legal support. Come and be damned, I opened this account! Who the hell you think put the money in the bank to begin with? The local community, while aware of Joe's cruelty, suddenly places the burden of resolving this situation on Dolores. Throughout the film, Dolores has been playing housekeeper to notorious Real Housewives of Maine socialite Vera Donovan, and she's been socking away in a secret bank account what little money Vera gives her as a plan to escape. But given the time period, the bank manager called her husband to let him know about the money, and Joe stole Dolores' mad money. Because I'm a woman, ain't it? If it'd been the other way around, if I'd been the one passing off a fairy story, how I'd lost a passbook and asked for a new one, you would've called Joe. That's when Vera, in a moment of feminine solidarity that transcends social class, essentially tells Dolores that Joe needs to meet with an accident. Husbands die every day, Dolores. And on the day of the eclipse, Dolores baits Joe into a fight, causing him to chase her and fall down an old well. Dolores Claiborne is of course a deeply personal story, but it doesn't take much to see that the characters represent recurrences of the social phenomena that King writes about. You ought to take a look at this, D. You might want to see what an ass is supposed to look like. <laughs> Vera and Dolores understand very little of one another, but they do understand the indifferent cruelty of their husbands. Sometimes being a bitch is all a woman has to hang on to. And Dolores understands that no amount of politeness or social nicety is going to save her or her daughter. Frankly, in mid-70s patriarchal Maine, they simply don't matter. I know you don't have to tell me, but I'm hoping you'll think for just one moment about the grief and heartache you could have saved me. In its closing scenes, Dolores Claiborne offers a sense of hard-won resolution rather than a neat and tidy conclusion. The relationship between Dolores and Selena is not magically mended, but there is the beginning of understanding and healing. Despite the tragedy and the relentless darkness in parts of the film, a glimmer of hope shines through as the indomitable spirit of Dolores Claiborne remains unbroken. Although it didn't make it from novel to film, during the eclipse, Dolores spies a young girl sitting in her father's lap. The girl looks like she needs help, but it seems to be some kind of mirage. That girl is Jessie Burlingame, the protagonist of King's earlier novel, Gerald's Game. Gerald's Game seemed to a lot of people, including readers like me, to be an impossible novel to adapt to film. It takes place primarily in one location. It's mostly the inner monologue of a single protagonist. The protagonist is lashed in place and can barely move. That's what makes Mike Flanagan's 2017 adaptation all the more impressive. Flanagan is no stranger to difficult adaptations. Having since breathed new life into The Haunting of Hill House, The Turn of the Screw, and The Fall of the House of Usher, as well as the sequel to one of Stephen King's most famous novels, The Shining. Like King, Flanagan appreciates a world that is lived in, so we get a number of fun references to both other King works, to who could possibly hear you scream? Is that Cujo over there? And Flanagan Films. And of course, lead actress Carla Gugino is a longtime Flanagan collaborator. Naturally, the important thing is not the Easter eggs, but how the two stories are connected thematically. Jesse and Gerald's marriage isn't as hopeless as the St. George's was, but it's slipped into a sort of general malaise thanks to mutual disinterest. In an effort to spice up their marriage, they take a trip to Little Tall Island, the same island where the St. George's reside. There, Jesse agrees to take part in a little bondage fantasy of Gerald's, although agrees is doing a lot of work in that sentence. It's more like she relents to pressure even after voicing her discomfort. It's important to contrast the Gerald Burlingames of the world from the Joe St. George's of the world, even though they're two sides to the same coin. And what is a woman, anyway? A life support system for a stupid fucking cunt. Joe St. George is what we might call hard power. He uses overt physical and verbal abuse to push Dolores around. He's a manifestation of the island's old world patriarchal sexism. Gerald, on the other hand, is passive aggressive, always playing the victim whenever Jesse draws a boundary. I just, I feel ridiculous. Nice. Now I'm ridiculous. No. And we later learn there's a reason why this tactic works so well on Jesse. During an argument over their relationship, Gerald suddenly keels over from a heart attack, leaving Jesse alone. Stranded in the woods with no one around except a dog that is getting hungrier and hungrier. And although outwardly this is a story about survival, King and Flanagan turn it into a therapy session, using Jessie's helplessness in this situation as a metaphor for her weakness and trauma in everyday life. You never told me you heard it. You never raised an objection. You smiled through the night, hated me a little bit. Like Selena St. George before her, Jessie uncovers some agonizing memories about that eclipse and about her father. That's a beautiful dress. Mom said it was too short. Mom's wrong. 
Her father, by the way, is played by another longtime Flanagan collaborator, Henry Thomas, who delivers such a pitch-perfect gaslighting performance that it makes me want to punch my TV screen. Maybe we should tell Mom. I hate to. Just because things have been pretty tense between the two of you lately. In fact, everyone from Kathy Bates to Jennifer Jason Lee to Carla Gugino to David Strathern to Judy Parfit gives an award-worthy performance across these two films. You must have boyfriends. Beautiful girl like you, smart and out in the world, telling me there's nobody? I'm telling you there's a lot of nobodies. The patriarchal issues are portrayed in a number of ways in both stories. In Dolores Claiborne, the problems are more institutional. The bank, the community, and the sheriff's office all blame Dolores for her lot in life and act as obstacles when she does try to get out from under Joe's thumb. It's only when Vera shares that there is a way out, somewhat serving as a role model for how to be an independent woman, that Dolores is empowered to fight back. Jessie, on the other hand, has to overcome her own internalized misogyny. Her father victimized her and then victimized her again, convincing her that revealing what he'd done would actually hurt a lot of people. Jessie overcomes this through a combination of physical survival and conversations with manifestations of herself and Gerald. Son is starting down. He'll be here soon. Then I'll have to hurry. In the end, both films celebrate women's resilience through survival stories in the face of patriarchy. One story external and one internal. And both reveal something about the struggles women went through and continue to go through when the world doesn't care enough to do anything about it. Stay warm, stay safe, wash your hands, don't look at the sun, Return your shopping carts, and I will see you next time. Every now and then I want to part, and I need you now, tonight.